Hello everyone. So my name is Namra and uh, we'll be talking about drafting. So the story begins. We wanted to redefine our user's experience. And in the process of this redefine, we wanted to focus on showcasing more users. And all this was supposed to happen with no performance leakage. At that time, we were really not sure how we were gonna achieve it. But gradually did it. So let's take a sneak peek what we exactly wanted to achieve. So we wanted to transform the left hand side of the slide to something on the right hand right hand side of the screen. So I'll take a couple of minutes to explain what we do exactly. So Adobe Experience Cloud, that's the kind of provides a single end-to-end -end user experience to our marketers to manage and provide social media campaigns and posts. So what I mean by that is we provide a single interface to our customers across the different social media platforms, be it Twitter, be it Facebook, be it Instagram, from which the customers can moderate and create posts all under a single thing. So basically, rather than going to Twitter separately or going to Facebook separately, reading your post there, seeing who has who has liked this comment or uh, you want to like a particular post there, you can do everything on this single, single interface and rather than going to Twitter and Facebook so we wanted to focus on surfacing more users. Like as you can see in the left hand side slide, we just have our active page or a page that says the title of the post and the particular media saying that this particular post belongs to Twitter and it has been now delivered or posted on the social media platform. So we wanted to start from the, to the right hand side of the screen, which has a content, uh, which has a lot of content and statistics. It has a conversation API where we can see the whole thread attached to this particular post. Where we, where we will be showing the various comments and the various replies of these comments. We wanted to show the number of followers, for example, we wanted to show the profile image of this customer and we wanted to show various other things. Similarly for Facebook, we wanted to transform and give, up, give our audience or give our customers a good experience of content. We wanted to show whether this particular post has been liked by someone or not, we wanted to show uh, whether it has been read by someone or not, Let's break up this time in content in respect to its results. In addition to the previous information which we were displaying for the users, we wanted to show more information. And I have break up this time in terms of the performance. So the first one we had is content data. It would give us the name of the user, it would give us the profile image, it would show us the various actions which have been performed on this particular image, and it would show the date rated content. Second, we had this analytics tool, which would show the numbers such as the numbers of followers which, particular, which this particular user has, which would show the number of tags which this particular post has been using. And the third and last, we had this conversation API, which as I mentioned before, will be giving me an entire thread of the conversation on this particular post, listing the various comments and the various replies of this particular post. So, over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about how we went from so early and slow and how Drafter came to our rescue. So the first problem we faced was the sheer number of API users. We need to get data from three different resources and then organize it into a structure that would make sense for our clients. For example, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, that we had this client which was talking to three services, which was the content API, the analytics API, and the conversation API. The worst part that these API calls couldn't be made in parallel because we had to wait for the response from the content API before we could hit or fire the analytics API and the conversation API. The second problem we faced was that there was an overfitting of data. The whole data was simply dumped on the UI and it was the duty of the front-end developer to nitpick from this gigantic information. So we wanted to move this logic at the back end so that it would enhance our performance and the over overhead would no longer be persistent. And the even phase two. So I have deliberately put this plot image here because at that time our website was getting rendered even slower than this plot is rendered. So yes, there was a poor performance definitely. Uh, the page load time was around 8 to 9 seconds and the page size was around 2. And if I was in an area which had really poor internet connectivity, and let's assume that each of these API calls took five to six minutes, five to six seconds, sorry. So I would be getting my page rendered in a code of 18 seconds, which was too much and quite expensive for us. 
we have a problem and we look for some uh, solutions for it. Let's take a look. So we either lifted the whole information which we have dumped on the screen, which we were doing initially. The second was we could have added a URL parameter to filter the data on the backend. And the third was to create a new custom REST endpoint called together, which would give exactly the same data which we required and which would obviously lead to an explosion of customers. So by this time, we must be wondering what the hell is happening. Trust me, even we felt that we had no solution to such a problem because we had to make three long trips to the server, we had to liquid the data at the front end, so what to be exact? But Yahoo came to us. So uh, it was it would be awesome if we could get all this information in a single long trip and that would exactly the same shape which we required. So this is exactly what round trip helped us. So just to be uh, clear and every, to bring everyone on the same page in terms of what GraphQL exactly is, I would like to mention here that GraphQL is just a syntax. It's a query language. It has nothing to do with the data. It has no data associated with it. You just ask it and it will get you the information in exactly the same format you asked for. So this is exactly how a sample query looks in GraphQL. So uh, we can, I have this get active or get post query, wherein I exactly ask for the information I need. For example, I ask for the title, the created ad, I could have asked for the author's information in that single API only, given me the number of the name of the author, the name of the author, the path, which is the profile image of the author, and the number of followers this particular author has. In this single query only, I could have asked for the comments and the title of these comments, and for example, I wanted the name of the author who created those comments. So GraphQL beautifully supports this data nesting and I can beautifully write my data needs inside the other data types. So at that time what we were doing was creating our schemas, manually creating the queries and for every query or how GraphQL works is that we, uh, for every theme we get resolvers and these resolvers are then, are then fired in a tree-like fashion. So for example I have this get activity over here. Uh, for each of these queries, we call them fields, and for each of these fields, I get a resolver. And once the root level resolver is resolved, for example, the get activity, uh, GraphQL waits for its response and then fetches the title and the comments, which are the second fields at the second nested level. And inside that, once I get the activity from comments, I fetch the title and the author. And similarly, the cascading goes down in the tree like fashion. So the benefits were quite clear that it elim eliminated multiple round trips to the server. We now had to do only just one round trip and we'll be getting all our data in a single API. So it solved the problem of underfetching and overfetching. Whatever I ask, I exactly gave uh, exactly gave in the same response. So for example, this is a joke, right? I have this field which says like I just want the name and height. And as we can see in the lower down of the section that it gets incrementally, uh, it gets incremented as soon as I ask for the query. Right? So as soon as I remove the mask from here, it will get removed in the response also. So this is what GraphQL provides us. And the third, it makes uh, it easier to aggregate data for multiple resources. So rather than the client talking to each of these three different APIs, we had this complexity handled by the GraphQL layer and what client was supposed to do was simply make a call to the GraphQL layer and the GraphQL layer will be handling all the complexities behind this query. So the GraphQL layer will handle uh, talking to the content API so. So. Now our new architecture diagram looks something like this. So instead of, as I mentioned, instead of the client talking to these three different APIs, the 
client just talked to the graphical hub voice server, asked what it needed, and the Apollo server uh, handled the complexity talking to talking to these three different APIs, and it was all successful. So at that time, we were like, okay, we have solved the problem, and uh, we were very happy and everything. But little did we know that it was a short distance. Suddenly, after some time, we see that our graphical query started failing, and we were quite in a shocking state at that time because we had not made any changes to our graphical server. And the last time we checked that it was all working fully, very well. So after some investigation, we found that the graphical server which we had built for and one of uh, and the one of our REST APIs that is that was the content API in our case were now out of sync. So someone had made a change to the content API. And one of the service, one of the fields was deleted, and as a result, we were not getting any data on the report. So at that time, we brought, we manually fixed the our graphical schema and get it all sorted so that we were having our data in the on the UI and we were getting our page better. But we were quite sure that this was not a full time solution for us. So what did we do? The first thing we did was to set up a GitHub bot, which will tell us that. Okay, so something has been changed to this in this service. So graphical people be aware that your schema might now you know go out of sync and uh, manually fix your schema. But this was clearly not a solution when it comes to uh, production uh, when it comes to production and scaling. So what we did was to set up a task every five minutes would talk to each of our REST API every five minutes and requesting for some information. So luckily for us, the our REST API is good. That they would be providing us the APIs, which the, the particular endpoints, which that particular REST API supports, as well as the schema we learned by those endpoints. So now it was very easy for us. Once we get all this information, the next thing we were supposed to do was write a one on one task with me, a schema which was returned by our graphical services and, the, uh, and our graphical schema. Then, after picking the service every five minutes, we would generate automatically a graphical schema from the REST APIs and we would be having our graphical server in sync with each and every REST APIs for every five minutes. So, this is a sample of how we got our uh, uh, return in which what will be required for the REST API. So, for the type activity, I had this schema which was returned by my REST API saying the ID, the title, and the, let's say, this thing post and the other thing. Uh, next is the type activity resource, which lists down the endpoints which that particular REST API exposed. For example, I have just uh, listed down a few of them. Like, get me this particular activity, or get me all the activities, get me the type, or get me the activity that filtered by type. By type. So, the conversation, uh, so the conversion was now very easy. What would have looked in a REST API, as you can see on the top box, is like, I'll be getting a uh, I'll be filing an REST API and saying that I'm going to my title and the title is hello and the fields are so and so. When it was easily transformed to my graphical schema, saying that, okay, this is the query, the active resource is the query type, and I want to filter it by title, I have the title as hello, and I want these particular fields in this box the ID, the region, and I have this So it was also. <coughs> Till now, what we talked about was basically a uh, graphical at the server or at the backend. Now we move to front end. Earlier, we were using products for our state management, uh, for, for our state management. But with graphical, uh, this was no longer required because most of our state management code handled by products was about manipulating the data which we received from these REST APIs. But since now we were getting the exactly the same data we required, and the UI was not supposed to deal with all this information to manipulate the data, Redux was no longer required for our end. Also, uh, the asynchronous handling of the calls, which was like, for example, I had to wait for the content API and then getting its response in the UI, then loading the server and getting the data from the conversation API, was no longer no longer required because it was all handled by GraphQL again. The little state management we required was now easily achievable, achievable with the React state. So we could get away with Redux and we, have, we reduced a lot many of the chunk of code in our code base. 
another pain point for the work cashier. So when it comes to rest world, we have let's say hard coded endpoints and we can easily make use of the HTTP cache as we all know. But with Graphical, the problem was that every request was a post request and the body parameters kept changing on as per your requirement. So HTTP caching was not an option for us. So the first thing which we did was to switch from isomorphic fetch to upload fetch. Earlier our client was an isomorphic fetch as I mentioned. Now we switch to Apollo client. So Apollo client is what Apollo client does it, it provides an under the hood support for caching. So just to explain how Apollo client works. Uh, everything in GraphQL is every data manipulation or every data fetching is in the form of a graph. So and whatever result we receive is in the form of a uh, traversal path which is which we can say is in the form of a tree. So let's say we have these two queries uh, wherein we can easily see that uh, the second query is uh, the first query is a subset of the second query. So whenever when I uh, fire these two queries back to back via a Apollo client, what Apollo client does is it remembers the path of the traversal required to retrieve that particular object. Just to explain it more in detail, I have this auto query. What when I query, uh, when I fire the second query again, what it will do is it sees that okay, I have the traversal path. It has memorized the traversal path for the auto object, and rather than fetching the auto object again from the backend, what it does is it memorizes it and it uh, retrieves it from itself rather than making a call to the backend. So this is how a pull client works, and it usefully helps us to achieve. The second thing was uh, using automated persistent queries. So when it comes to GraphQL, we, uh, as we have seen that the query size is enormous and when it comes to production, it could go above 10kb maybe just because of the text of the query which we are writing. But when it comes to REST APIs, it's hardly 50 or 100 characters, right? So it was a bottleneck for us and uh, getting your performance degraded just on the basis of query size was something very bad, right? So we used automatic persistent queries. In automatic persistent queries, rather than passing the textual or the uh, English type language or the English type query, we pass a hash. So what the Apollo server does is, it's, it receives a uh, hash from the Apollo client. registry finds the required or uh, if it finds a match for that particular hash it retrieves the query from its registry and fires and uh, fires it to the server in case the hash is not found the Apollo server says okay I don't know what this particular hash is it tells the client the same thing I don't know this about this hash please pass me the textual query so Apollo client gives the textual query to the uh, Apollo server Apollo server registers it registers it so that next time when this particular hash or this uh, query is gonna come it will be retrieving it and uh, there won't be any there won't be any requirement to pass that textual query and the whole server then talks to our underlying services to get the results. The third thing which we use for caching was data loaders. So data loaders is a utility which is provided by Facebook and it provides useful support for caching and caching. The whole purpose is to make less number of API calls to the backend, right? So data loaders handle that very nice. Let's take an example. So for example, I have a query which lists down the post and it lists down in particular the names of the authors which uh, who have commented, let's say, on this post. Now these authors can be repetitive, right? So if I'm not using data loaders, what will happen with GraphQL is something like this. And it will be fetching the information about author 1 and 2 repetitively. Let's assume that only author 1 and author 2 have commented on this particular page. So rather than making these API calls again and again, what data loaders or Facebook data loaders does is that it provides, it batches these requests. So rather than uh, sending 1 and 2 again and again, it batches these requests and sends 1 and 2 and it uh, in return provides a promise object for the same. So once this particular thing has been resolved, it gives it to the UI for entry. Also, the node function.
function as we see here is used for caching. So once, uh, for example, again I again some uh, I make some query and uh, I'm asking for the same author for the one. So this dot function remembers that uh, the key one was passed to me, saying that okay I don't need to make a call again to the backend and I can retrieve the information directly from here rather than making a call to the backend. So this was the third thing which we implemented for caching. So now our final architecture diagram is something like this. That we had a full client in place of the isomorphic bridge which we did introduce. We had this GraphQL Apollo server which will be talking to Apollo client and managing all the underlying services which are in our case to update and update the information. So the performance of that was not good. So the page size decreased from 2 MB to 300 MB. And the page load time also decreased from 9 seconds. So this is our sample output uh, of the whole chunk of data of the whole screen which we saw in the first slide. So I have this bit activity exactly has that same information which I require, which I, which I need to render that particular type, uh, including the information from all the three conversations, all the three APIs, the conversation API, the analytics API, or the content API, and exactly that particular information which that particular type was printed at that particular time. And uh, there's no overfitting of data, and all the results are retrieved in a single data. So, a key, key takeaways from this one. Like, now you can draft your multiple APIs in a single call via GraphQL. Also, I would like to add that GraphQL was a, is a heritage. Like, you don't have to basically transfer, you don't have to write everything from scratch for it, you don't have to restructure your best APIs for that. It's just an additive layer. So, you can easily make the transformation for me. When it comes to uh, asking for single API fetching. Second, you no need to rewrite the APIs for different clients. For example, my Android client, uh, it's just an hypothetical case. Uh, for example, my Android client was asking for just the name of the followers, and uh, let's say my iOS client was asking for the name as well as the ID for the followers. Uh, with a particular REST API, which I would have to make changes to the query parameters, maybe, but with GraphQL, you don't need to make any your APIs, you just need to modify your query and you get the results very easily. Third is the on demand data modification, which is basically get what you ask for. You can easily make your apps stable and reusable and uh, get free caching via it. 